If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at cottageblogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer. I'm delighted to be back with you after a wonderful 10-day vacation in Belize. First time we've been to Belize, we went to Placencia, which is uh, south of Belize City. It was absolutely wonderful. Of course, the weather was beautiful. It was hot. It was sunny. The water was warm. And we stayed in a really lovely villa. Uh, Of course, my daughter-in-law said the other day, she said, you choose the most amazing places. Uh, Yeah, uh, I spend a lot of time searching for exactly the right place. I know exactly what I'm looking for and invariably get it right. Uh, So we had a fabulous time at Starfish Villa in Placentia. And thank you to the owners, uh, Gail and Paul, for for making it such a great trip. The owners actually lived above the apartment that we stayed in. So we got to talk to them on a number of occasions. And it's always really nice, you know, talking to owners, seeing uh, how they feel about having guests in their property. And uh, it was uh, it was it was really great. I loved meeting them. And this was the seventh trip we've seventh seventh. February trip that uh, that we've been on. Sometimes we've been as a, as a complete family. We've gone with Mike and Andrea, sometimes with the kids. Uh, this time it was just Phil and I. We just had a, a little break on our own. But over the last seven years, we've been to Maui. We've been to Costa Rica, uh, Eleuthera, a couple of times to Exuma, because uh, if you listen to the podcast, you know that we actually bought a piece of land in Exuma after one of those trips. So we've uh, we've been there three times and and now Belize. And actually, having got back on Saturday, we're already looking at uh, where we're going to go next year. And, and interestingly enough, two places across the radar, one is Nicaragua and the other is Puerto Rico. So if anybody out there has got any suggestions or recommendations on where we should go. And if we should go to either of those two places, I'd love to hear from you. But you know, one thing that um, that I, I want to talk about today is information. And I know I've harped about on about this before, and I will do so again and again. And one of it, so, so really no apologies for revisiting this topic, because the only way you'll ever create a perfect guest experience is to actually be a guest yourself, to actually go through the motions, go through the process, understand exactly what your guests are going to experience. And I don't mean actually in the property. You might have, you know, it's your property. You might have slept in all the beds, cooked in the kitchen, watched the television and understood how to manage the the remote controls had the AC on or off or or whatever, and you understand your property. But what I think you need, why I think you need to go and experience being a guest yourself is to, to fully appreciate how the information you provide to your guests can actually make or break a vacation. There is information that you can provide or information that you withhold, not necessarily deliberately, but you know, you just don't tell your guests some things. And just the fact that they don't have this information could make a serious impact on your vacation. And I just got to now, you know, now I got what well, well, now I'm home. I, I was sort of reflecting on the vacation we've just had thinking about how the reality matched up with what was promised, which was, you know, pretty much, let's say, 90%. But what really came to mind was 
how much information that each of the owners over the past seven or eight years, and not just on this February trip, but on a, on a whole range of other vacation rentals I've stayed at, um, how much information was provided and, and how the owners actually shared their knowledge during our stay as well. Now let's, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about travel planning because I'd say I am pretty independent as far as travel planning is concerned. At the moment, I'm planning a trip to Berlin and Amsterdam um, next week. I'll be going to Berlin to visit my new granddaughter for the first time and then on to Amsterdam for, um, for the Vacation Rental Management Association conference. And, and I've done all the planning. You know, I've, I've booked the flights. I'm flying into Amsterdam. I'm going from Amsterdam to Berlin. I'm just looking into how I get public transport from Tegel Airport in Berlin to where my son lives. And then back to Amsterdam a few, uh, a few days later. And so, so yeah, I'm, I'm an independent soul when it comes to, to traveling. And, and in this instance, you know, I'm, I'm actually staying in a hotel in Berlin because I can't find a, an, a, uh, a vacation rental to stay in because it's pretty much banned across the city. Um, so I don't expect the hotel to supply me with, with much information on, on how to get from Tegel Airport to the hotel. So I'm doing that all myself. Um, we'll get some feedback from my son, I hope. And, and in Amsterdam, I've booked an Airbnb and we're two and a half weeks out and I haven't heard yet from the owner of that Airbnb with, with any information on, on how to get there from the airport. Or, so I, I'm, I'm once again doing all that, that legwork myself, which is absolutely fine. But so, so I can Google along with anyone else, but I still welcome information that comes from owners because they've got so much knowledge of the local area. And it's something I'm finding sadly lacking in the, so many of the places that I've stayed over the past seven to 10 years. And, you know, owners or managers, managers as well, are the information sources that guests need to ensure a great stay. And withholding that information can make the difference between frustration and irritation at not having the information when you get there and a well-executed and enjoyable information because you have got the information um, to start with. And I want to give you an example from, from my, this most recent vacation. Now, we knew from looking at the reviews from the property we were staying that there were a number of, of day trips we'd like to go on. And one was called the Monkey River Tour, and it takes you to um, a little small hamlet called Monkey River. It's about a 40-minute boat ride, and then you go past Monkey River and actually up the river itself. And it's fantastic. You, we, we saw crocodiles and um, loads of different birds and turtles and it, it was a really great educational trip and I as I say I'd heard about it from the um, the reviews on the property on VRBO so what I what I hadn't heard and what I didn't get information on was how we should equip ourselves for a trip because I, what I forgot to mention is that we also had a sort of 30, 40 minute trek through the jungle to to find some howler monkeys and to listen to howler monkeys. And uh, and that was great because the guide uh, is known as King of the Howlers. I'll put to, I'll put a link to Percy, our guide, on the, in the show notes because uh, he's been featured in Esquire magazine. He's done documentaries. He works with with a couple of U.S. universities. Um in their, I guess, their naturalist and environmental programs to actually bring students down to learn about howler monkeys. So that's a bit of a, an, an aside. But I just wanted to mention, you know, we had this 40-minute walk through the jungle. And there was myself and my husband and three other ladies that, uh, that went on this trip. Now, fortunately, I... When, when I'm going on vacation, I never miss the opportunity to exercise and go running. So I always have my running shoes with me. And um, 
my husband is not a he's not a flip flop wearer and he's not an open toe sandal wearer. So he he always has walking shoes with him. So we figured that we should take these, wear these shoes when we went on this river trip because we were doing the jungle walk. Now, sadly, the three other ladies that were with us hadn't got the memo. They had come to Belize. They'd come to Placencia for a really great beach stay and and hadn't really thought about the fact that they might go on a couple of outings that would involve a a walk through the jungle. So the three ladies had flip-flops. And the other part of this story you should know is that the previous day we'd had some pretty torrential rain. So I have to say this, this jungle floor was, it was squelchy to say the least. Now I'm walking sort of behind these three ladies who are walking behind the guide and I, I felt so sorry for them because every time they put a foot down in this squelchy mud, try to lift their feet up, their flip-flops would come off. And the mud was squelching up through their toes. It was, it was, it was pretty awful to watch. One of the ladies then took her shoes off and decided she was just going to walk barefoot, which I, you know, given what was around on this, um, on the jungle floor, I probably wouldn't have, um, have have done that myself but she said it's the only way I can get through this and another lady said when is this going to end I can't take much more of this and I thought oh my goodness if you had had the if you'd got the memo if you'd got the information that said bring shoes bring closed toed shoes to do the jungle walk if you do the monkey river trip then their experience of that trip would have been massively different. Now, how simple is that? How simple is that to let people know before they, while they're planning their trip, before they pack their suitcases, that if you're going to do this type of trip, which is is very, very popular in Placencia, then, you know, you bring along the right footwear. So, hence the title to this podcast, Don't Wear Flip-Flops in the Jungle and other things your guests need to know. Because I I want to talk about this whole issue of information, what we should supply to our guests before they go on vacation, while they are there, and, and to some degree, just before they leave. You know, as a, as a rental agency, and you know that I run a rental agency here in Ontario, and, and we have guests who come and stay with us from across the world. It's not just people coming out of, um, of the city of Toronto, although probably 85% of them do. Uh, and that's another story I'll come to in a second. But we do have international visitors. And we make a, a big point of preparing an information pack for our international visitors so that they know what to expect when they arrive here. Now, you know, you'd think it's just, you know, it's North America. What can be so different about traveling in North America than traveling in Europe um, or England or any other worldwide country, any other worldwide first world country, third world country, whatever, you know, civilized country with great roads, with great facilities, with, um, with, you know, it, it's almost as you would be used to at home. I think you get my drift here. But there are some major differences. And, and these are the things that we supply in, as, a, as an information pack to our, informa- uh, to our international guests. Some of the things that we tell them are the rules of the road. If you're going to go driving, if you're going to rent a car, you have to know the rules of the road before you get out on the road. For example, in in England, when you're driving, it's not common to stop for a school bus. And in Ontario, as it is in um, many North American states and provinces, it's the law that you must, if a school bus is in front of you and it stops, you have to stop 
in both directions if you're not on a divided highway. So just giving them that information prior to coming, you know, these are the rules of the road. It will help them not get into trouble. Um, another one is is turning red on a uh, turning right on a red light. Until we came out to Canada, we'd we'd never never heard of this. That when you get to a red light, uh, unless there is a sign that tells you specifically not to, if it's safe to go, you can turn right. Um, and when we first came out here, we were we we had no idea of this and ended up being beeped at and. Um, not knowing why, because it was a red light and we were used to just stopping. You stop and you wait for it to turn green, which um, annoyed many of the drivers pulling up behind us who, who could see that there was nothing coming and that we could easily turn right. So, and one other thing that, uh, that is common in North America and Canada are four-way junctions. We don't have four-way junctions in, in the UK. You know, the sort of junction where that you arrive to and everybody takes their turn in going. And I remember the first time, in fact, we went to the US um, about 15 years ago and and got to this junction and there were no lights. It, there was no roundabout and we couldn't figure out who had priority, but people seemed to know. Um, we did figure it out fairly soon. But it was but it would have been nice at that time to have that knowledge before we went. So at least we understood what um, what was expected of us. Um, other things that we help our international guests with before they go in their planning is that um, in Ontario, you can't buy beer and wine in a supermarket. And and this was something when we first, very first time we came out to Ontario, we went in, we had a late flight, we went into the supermarket uh, loaded up with food and then went to look for the booze aisles and there were none. And it's just like, is this a dry province? What, what's, you know, what's the deal here? And, and in fact, we were then, we were then told at the checkout that no, you can't buy beer and wine in a supermarket. You buy them in an LCBO or a beer store. And then we're, then we're promptly told, but sorry, um, these these um, these outlets have just closed because it's just gone eight o'clock at night and they closed at eight o'clock. Now, had we known that prior to going out to uh, Ontario for that first time, for for my husband in particular, the beer store would have been the first place to stop because he had his first his first night on night on vacation. In fact, our first night on vacation as a family was without that uh, that cold beer that you crack the moment you've arrived and you've unloaded your luggage and you want to go and sit on the dock or sit out on the patio and have that first cold beer and relax and enjoy being on vacation. Now, one other thing that we, we tell our guests, this is, this is actually um, a, a really important one, was that you, you can't drink, you can't have open alcohol in, a, in any public place. So whereas in England we'd go out and um, um, buy a, a bottle of wine and some beers to take on a picnic, in Ontario you can't do that. It is a, it is an offence to to drink alcohol in a public park. So to go to a provincial park, you you can't take your cooler, um, and and we actually did fall foul of that. Um, fortunately, we were not fined, but. We uh, we were approached by um, a parks official to to tell us that it was um, a finable offence and that we were breaking the law. So this is what I want to talk about. You know, you, you've got to let your your guests know these things before they go, so that they don't get themselves into trouble. Because if if this happens, then you've got unhappy guests. Unhappy guests who are going to say, well, why didn't they tell me this? You know, am I expected to find out by myself? Well, I did a similar episode, or it might have been a, a blog post, a couple of years ago. And I, I was mentioning something similar to this. I, I can't remember exactly what. I, I think I was talking about rainy days, actually, and, and just saying, isn't it nice to prepare a rainy day plan so that your guests have something, some idea of things to do if it rains. 
And and I got a little bit of backlash from that from a couple of owners who said, you know, we, our guests aren't babies. They can find this out for themselves. That you know that there's there's plenty of tourist places for them to go. They can read the guest book. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and you know, I don't need to be hand holding them that much. And I was I was totally blown away by that attitude. You know, what do we want? We want our guests to give us a fantastic review. And and if we have to spend time, our very, very precious vacation time, trying to look for things to do because it's the, the weather's miserable, that is not going to endear the location, the owner, the property to anybody. And, uh, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, I understand that it's unfair if a guest writes a poor review because the weather was bad. But if a guest writes a poor review and says the weather was bad and we had no idea what to do um, and we didn't find out all these things that we could have done until later, that is relevant. That really is relevant. So I, I mentioned, you know, um, in our management agency, that 85% of our guests come out of the city. So you'd think, you know, they're only driving two hours, two, maybe three, four max to get to a property that they would know everything. And I just want to give you one example of why you should provide information to your guests prior to them going. A couple of years ago, we were um, staying uh, up in Huntsville, which is about um, two hours north of us with... Um, with my sister and we had we were picking up an uncle and aunt who'd come across from England and we committed the I wouldn't say it's, you know it's definitely not a crime not to fill your car up with fuel when you're going into cottage country but it is a huge mistake not to because what happened we were up there we'd um, we hadn't filled filled the car up before we came off the highway and we had a, a weekend with my sister and there was a big storm that went through that took the power out. So on the Monday when we, we were coming back with uncle and aunt back to our place, we had very limited fuel and the power was still out across a swathe of cottage country. And what we found was that as we were getting back onto the highway, that the, I say the highway, the county road, that we stopped the first gas station we stopped in. No, sorry, no fuel because no power. And then we stopped at another one. No power, no fuel. And we were literally on fumes by the time we actually found a gas station that, uh, that had some power and we were able to fill up. So we do tell our cottage rental guests that are coming out of Toronto about this, that they sh that's the last thing they should do before leaving the major highway is fill up their car with fuel because you don't know if something's going to happen to prevent you from from getting out and and there's a number of other things we tell our cottage rental guests that are different in cottage country from what they would expect at home like how to use a septic system um why they have to deliver their own garbage to to the dump and there is no garbage pickup so there's a number of things that uh, that we prepare in what we call our generic cottage information. And it really is an educational piece to, to share information on the differences when our guests get to cottage country. So, so what do you want to prepare your, so, so what do you do to prepare your guests for their stay? You know, how much do you share? How far do you go to help them plan? Well, I'm just going to go through a couple of things that I think that you should do to ensure that your guests are going to have the best vacation ever. And I'll just go back to a conversation I was having with the with the owner of the property we stayed in last week. And I was um, you know, talking about communication with guests because prior to prior to our, our stay, I had sent them several emails and I sent you know, emails about, you know, what should I take with me? Um, I'm going to Belize for the first time ever. I really don't know what it's like. I've been to other Caribbean um, countries and islands and I just wanted to see if it was the same, you know, thing, things like, can I bring meat into the country? Should I? 
Should I, when we go to Exuma, we always take bacon and cheese because it's horrendously expensive. And, you know, I got some great responses. But when I was talking to the owner and she said, yeah, she said, oh, oh, she said, we get tons of those questions. And it just popped into my mind. Why don't you prepare something to give to your guests prior to their stay? And these are the sorts of things. I'm just going to run through a list of, of seven things that I think that you should tell your guests before they, uh, that they, they leave to come to your place. Now, if your guests are coming through customs and immigration, you know, if you've got international guests, then it's so important to tell them what to expect at the airport. I came back through Miami the other day and I, I have a Nexus or a global entry card and fr from, from actually arriving at the um, immigration um, area, where there were, oh, there were just a whole slew of people. I, I couldn't believe how many people. Um, but it, was, it took me four minutes to arrive there to actually get through uh, into the departure lounge to, for, to, to get my connection because I carry a, a, a global entry card. And I would recommend that everybody goes and gets their global entry or Nexus card if you're in Canada. Um, I love it. It was, it was amazing because of the amount of people that were going through this immigration process, this, this line that was just going backwards and forwards and people shuffling along it and looking as unhappy as they could possibly be. But the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, I, I talked to somebody later that day who said that they had been two and a half hours in the lineup at, uh, at immigration to get a connection. So if you've got guests coming to you and they may go through an airport where you know they're going to wait in line, you want to make sure that they don't, that they have plenty of time between their arrival and getting their connection out. Because apparently, you know, the, the, the immigration officials really don't care if you miss your flight. Um, you've got to allow, at Miami, somebody said to me, you've got to allow four hours. It's, it's, it's don't do it with an hour and a half to try and land in Miami, go through immigration and get your connecting flight. You're going to miss it. So it's simple um, information like that. Um, I remember going to Exuma. I know that, um, that the uh, customs at Nassau, is is great they they allow food in you're allowed to take um th things like cheese and bacon and some meat as long as you declare it um they are fine with it so we've always taken a a, a cold bag that um with with ice packs that's been tucked into our checked baggage and you know last last time we we took steaks we took pork chops bacon sausage all these things that were that were much more expensive to get there. And it was easy to go through. But apparently, um, the Belizean immigration are less, uh, are less happy with you doing that. And you would run the risk of having these things confiscated. So I would want to know what I can bring in, what it's like when you're coming through customs and immigration. The second thing is what to take. You know, specific clothes and shoes. Tell me to bring, you know, if, I, if, if, if you're planning on going on one of these trips, then you need to bring closed-toed shoes. Um, you know, tea bags are expensive. Bring your own tea bags. Bring your coffee, not so much. You can certainly buy coffee in, in um, um, Central America, uh, far nicer coffee than you can get here. So, but, but I always take tea bags because I know that. I know that they're expensive and I'm not going to get the variety I want. And it could be, you know, really um, simple things like after sun lotion. Bring after sun lotion because that's non-existent. You can't find that in Belize. So and I know this because I got a little bit burnt last week and I had to go out and look for some sort of salve to put on my, uh, my sunburn. And that was tough to find. 
So the other, th- so you know, let your guests know what they should bring and what they should not bring. I mean, we we were told to bring um, mosquito repellent for these trips. You know, it wasn't so much while we were actually at the property, although there was some problem with sand flies. But actually, going out on these trips, you needed to have some good mosquito repellent. Thirdly, tell your guests about the cost of living. I, I'd actually gone online and found a, a long list of the different um, pricing for different things in Belize. But what I hadn't realized is that Placencia, south of Belize City, is much more expensive than the other areas such as um, San Pedro or um, uh, Kay Corka, some, some of the others, uh, other areas that are perhaps not so, um, not so upmarket. Apparently, Placencia is the most upmarket place in Belize. So... I would have liked to have known um, how hugely expensive wine was. And um, in in fact, I I said I would like to have known. Our um, hosts did tell us that that's one thing we should pick up at the airport uh, duty-free was a few bottles of wine because you expect to pay about double the price um, than you would uh, at home. Um, so, you know, let them know what, what, what things are going to cost and, and some idea of where, why you should buy local. Um, I went out for, our, for my, and, and this goes into my, um, my fourth um, thing, is, is food. Uh, because we do a lot of self-catering. Don't eat out a huge amount. I like to cook. So I would have liked to have known before I went shopping and, and bought my craft cheese and um, and maple leaf bacon, that these things were going to be double the cost of the local stuff, which I, I hadn't even seen in the supermarket freezer compartment. Um, so so that was that was got a little bit of a sticker shock um, with that, you know, paying eighteen dollar uh, uh, ten. $12 for a pack of bacon when I could have bought the local stuff at half the price. So just some of these things, you know, it's, it's just so so worthwhile to know before you go. The other thing was is that I didn't make the mistake of buying frozen beef. Now, you know, usually when we're away, I will buy um, ground ground beef and and just, just to make beef burgers to go on the barbecue. Uh, apparently it's very tasty the beef, but it's incredibly tough because in Belize, they don't hang the meat. Simple thing to know. But, uh, you know, if if you've arrived and you go out and buy your ground beef or you go out and buy some steak, which is available, and then find that it's virtually inedible because it's so tough. And having paid a, a quite a, a high price for it, you're not going to be very happy. But being informed beforehand, you are pre-warned. You know, you've got these expectations and there are no surprises. Um, the fifth thing you need to know about, you need to let your guests know about before they go, is events that they might need to book in advance. You know, other concerts. Is there, is there something that, um, that they might want to go and see or hear that they should get tickets in advance for. Reason being, of course, that you know you don't want to arrive on vacation and then find that there's an amazing event happening, but there's no tickets. It's all sold out when it would have been very simple to get some information beforehand about it. Then there is uh, culture and customs. Things like tipping, uh, whether you barter or not, you know, I, I went to, years and years ago, I went to Morocco and went shopping in the souk and learned very quickly that you need to barter. But I've always wanted to know, you know, when I go to a new new place, a Caribbean place or a, a Costa Rican place or, or somewhere somewhere new, it, should, should you barter? Our prices, particularly with, um, with maybe street vendors, um, somebody that comes up to you, lo- you know, local... Local people that are selling their souvenirs, um, is, it, is it done to barter? 
are they giving you a higher price because they expect you to barter? I mean, I don't agree with trying to uh, pair, you know, if you're buying from, from a local person, trying to pair the price down as far as you can because these people are out there trying to earn a living. But it's just useful to know if, if it's a custom to do that bartering or not. And also tipping. How much should you tip? Uh, how much should you tip a taxi driver? How much should you uh, tip somebody in, in a restaurant? Um, you know, usually it's common sense, but it's always worthwhile having a little bit of upfront information. I want, before I go, I want to know about day trips. I want to have a list of all the things I could do when I'm there so I can do my planning. I want to know how much they're going to cost. Um, how, do, how far in advance do they need to be booked? Now, with, with our trip to the Monkey River, Gail was fantastic. She, um, she, she did let us know in advance that she could book these trips for us and she asked on the first day whatever we want you know what did we want to do she would uh, she would organize that and and that was great and i really liked that we hadn't intended doing much in the way of day trips um but the the only thing i would say is that the only way i knew about these trips beforehand was by looking at the reviews uh on vrbo I didn't actually get a list of the different types of um, day trips in advance, which would have been really, really helpful. Next is rental information. Uh, rental of bikes, of golf carts, of watercraft. I mean, we checked out golf cart rental on our first day. We were in a villa. We could walk into town, but we thought, well, we, we could actually do a bit more exploring a bit further if we had a golf cart. And we went into the outlet to be told that yeah, we, we, we did need to book that in advance because they were all out of golf carts. They were all reserved. So those are the things that I want to know. I want to know before I go. And all it takes is a nice sheet, um, a PDF that's neatly written out that, that covers all those things. You only have to do it once and then you send it out to your guests, you know, a week, a couple of weeks or a month or so in advance to give them that opportunity to make their preparations. Okay, so that's before they go. While they're there, and this is this is one of my huge bugbears. And and I got some negative response when I mentioned this the last time, so I'm sure I'm going to get some something back on this one, but please, please don't make me read your guest book. I probably will. I probably will at some time sit down and read all the comments or some of the comments in your guest book, but they are written and handwritten normally. Sometimes it's difficult to read and they're repetitive. People say exactly the same thing. So to actually be asked to read through the guest book for suggestions of things to do or places to eat or places to go annoys me intensely. Um, you're making me do work on my vacation. And yeah, call me spoilt. But what I want to see is a really good welcome book that has your, as in the owner's suggestions for the best restaurants to, to eat at for the places to go and the things to see. I want to have a list of, or maybe a couple of different itineraries, suggested itineraries of, of what, to do on a, what to do on a rainy day. I want to see a list of shopping, where to find the butcher, where to find the local bakery. Are there veggie stands? You know, in, in Placencia, there were half a dozen different be veggie stands, and it took us a couple of days to actually pinpoint the really, really good one. Um, and it was some information that just came from the, from the owner as an aside. Oh, you should go to this one. Um, I would have liked that in a welcome book. Um, I mentioned rainy day ideas. So important to let your guests know those. Um, for me, I want, I want somebody to give me some information on the best jogging routes, the safest jogging routes. I, I want to go running. I want to feel safe while I'm running. And I want to, to run in nice areas. So why don't you help me out? 
um, by letting me know which are the best jogging routes. And the same goes for hiking trails, secret hiking trails, and places to walk the dog if you're taking a pet. So basically, I want from you, the owner, all the things that only a local will know as well. So that should all be in a welcome book or in when, when we went to when we went to Cyprus um, last year, the the owner had provided a couple of um, binders with very very neatly indexed information. So each different area of of Cyprus had a map and it had all the tourist information and there were also the owner's personal suggestions for what we should do, personal suggestions for restaurants and for the best beaches to go to. And it's just so important. And I'm just going to reiterate this once again. Please don't make me read reams of guest book entries. Help me plan my stay. Um, so, so, so there's the information beforehand and then there's the information that I want to look at when I get there. And it's so much nicer to have the owner's recommendations. And then I can use the guest book as, as a backup. You know, I can go to the guest book and I can read those testimonials. I can go online and read the testimonials from people who said that they've been on this trip and that trip and gone to this restaurant and that restaurant. And, and then I can make my, my own decisions. Um, but uh, but this is you know maybe it's just a personal thing. But if um, if I'm going to get up in the morning and think what should we do today, and then have to get out a guest book to once again read through all the suggestions, um, that's taking up time. That's taking up my precious vacation time, when a neatly laid out welcome book and um, and call it. I mean maybe it's not your welcome book. Maybe call it a vacation planner that somebody can look at on the first day of their vacation and really get a good structured idea of what's going to make their trip the best. Can you tell I'm on my, I'm on my soapbox again? Um, this, this is just, this is just so important to me as a guest. You know, I go back to things like going to Costa Rica and having to find out in the guest book the day before we left, where the best fish, where, you know, this, this obscure fish stand, um, where we promptly got in the car, we went out, and we got this amazing fish from this this guy, and you could not have found this place if you hadn't read the guest book and got that information. It could have been so much easier presented in a owner prepared document that said that was under a. a a um, a title of food or yeah where to find the fresh fish where to get the best fresh fish where to find the best ceviche um in uh, in exuma we learnt sort of second hand that there was a little stand on on the uh, beach in georgetown where they sold conch fritters which were fantastic but we had to sort of find that information out second hand so think about all the information that you could share with your guests either before they go or when they're there. And believe me, they're going to thank you for it. And you only have to do this once. This is what gets me. You only have to, you only have to create an FAQ page for your guests to answer all those frequently asked questions. You only have to do that once. You only have to prepare your pre-arrival information, telling them what to take and and the customs and immigration stuff and the rules of the road and things that keep you out of trouble. You only have to do that once. And then with your welcome book and your vacation planner, you only have to do it once. You just have to maybe update it every year and you know, make some, some little changes if you, if, if you've got, if, um, restaurants close down or if new restaurants open but help your guests by providing this information there's a couple of ways you can do this i'm saying you can provide just pdf documents that that are simply sent to your guests as an attachment 
you might use the you know, in, in your property you're going to use maybe hardback folders or binders to put all this information neatly indexed so it's easy easy to find you could use um, a digital format there's a lot of different digital formats coming out um, I'm testing one in a couple of weeks time I'm picking up um, a welcome book iPad at uh, f from a company called uh, oh gosh I can't remember the name but anyway that that will come in a later a later podcast um, I'm picking this up from a from a company at the Vacation Rental Management Association conference and I'll be trialing that so it's a digital format on an iPad and of course you could use the um, the glad to have you app that um, that's provided by HomeAway but I have to say I really I, I, I'm not a fan of that I like paper information I like to sit down and put my feet up on the first day or so or get up at the first morning of my vacation and start to plan what I'm going to do for that uh, for that week and I want to sit there with some with with hard copy that's purely my preference but it just goes to show you might think about different ways of presenting that information as I say you can tell I'm I'm on on my soapbox about this but, but it's so easy it really is so easy and and your guests will love you for it um, and it may it may seem like a bit of a chore at the start putting this information together but you know you can you can put it on your website it's another way of getting guests to go to your website after they've booked you know you want if they've come through from uh, from VRBO or HomeAway or any other source and they've gone through that book now process but you now have their email address you can email them with uh, you know, once they've booked, you can email them with a link to go to your website to check out all the information that you have on there on how they can plan their trip. Once they're on your website, they're going to explore it. And should they come back again, they're very likely to book directly through you. And that's what being independent is all about, is getting those, those guests to book directly through you. A little bit of information I think you should um, you should give to your guests before they leave. One is what to do prior to their checkout. What time do they have to leave? Um, what 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 condition do they have to leave the property in? Should they strip the beds? Should they not strip the beds? What 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 do you want them to do? Now most owners now say you know just just leave. Um, that's fine. Walk out just as you would in a hotel, which is great. But let them know. Don't leave people unsure of what they should do because there are different processes in different parts of the world. There's still areas up here in Ontario where, where guests are asked to do a full clean before they leave. And that means cleaning toilets and washing the wash basins. And if people are used to that and then they go somewhere else, they're at a bit of a loss if they don't have a full cleaning kit to, um, to do that. So it's just simple things. Let them know what they should do or what they needn't do prior to checkout. And then finally, the information you want to give them before they leave is how to review. How, what, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to write in your, in your guest book? Do you want them to go directly to your TripAdvisor listing or your VRBO or HomeAway listing? and make their review there and then. I love to do my reviews on the last night of my stay uh, because it's still fresh in my mind and, and I have great memories and you're more likely to get that five-star review at that time when you're basking in the glow of, of a day in the sun and you've just had such a great time. Maybe you've just been out for a last meal and you come back that's the time you want them to write a review, not sending them something a couple of weeks later, asking them to remember what it was like when they've been back at work a couple of weeks. So that's just some other information to give them before they leave, how to review and uh, suggest they do it then and there. And then how to rebook. You know, 
send them to your website. If you want to rebook, you've got them. This is about remarketing. So you, you've got them. They are uh, with you at that time. Get them thinking about rebooking, perhaps giving them some information on discounts or, or perhaps referrals as well. You want them to refer you to their friends. So give them the information on how they can do that and how they can perhaps um, save a little money along the way. I mean, there's a reason why stores will always point out, you know, things, places like, um, oh, I'm thinking we have winners in HomeSense up here in Canada. Um, TJ Maxx, I think, is, is, the, is, a, is the equivalent in, in the U.S. And when you're leaving that store, they'll always give you the receipt and say at the bottom, you know, if, if, you, um, if you review your experience today, we'll enter you into a draw. And, and that is the way that they try and get people to do that review. So there you are. There you are. That's my, that's my take on information, on the nature of the information that I think you need to provide to your guests before, during, and at the end of their stay. So, wow, can't believe I've got to the end of another episode. Oh, I wanted to let you know, I should have mentioned this right at the very beginning, we passed our 200,000th download over the weekend. 200,000 times these episodes have been downloaded. I am just uh, blown away with this, and I thank you all so much for, for listening. I also thank everybody, absolutely everybody, who emails me and asks a question or just comments on what they like about the podcast and you know sometimes what they don't like about the podcast. I do read every single email that comes into me at heather at cottageblogger.com. I do reply. Sometimes it takes me a few days because some of the emails I get are quite lengthy with lots of questions and, and I want to make sure I have time set aside to respond in full. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, the Vacation Rental Success Summit in Toronto on May the 5th and 6th is fast upcoming. So if you haven't got your tickets to VRSS yet, um, please go on over to the vacation rental success summit.com and, and get your tickets. It's going to be a fabulous event. I'm going to be, I can't wait to meet so many of my listeners. We're going to be having a little bit of a meetup and um, I'll look forward to seeing you there. So, you know, come along, join us, come to Toronto. It's gorgeous in May. And, uh, and I'd love to see you there. So for now, I'd just like to thank you once again for tuning in and for staying with me uh, on this episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. And I will see you, talk to you next week. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business. Oh,